Thank you very much, Pajet. In a, in a second I will get going. Yesterday, I was being interviewed by um, Agnes Frederick, and we were talking about technology. So um, I hope the technology does not defeat me tonight. Um, I'm going to read off my laptop, and, and so I'm just going to plug it in um, to make sure that the battery doesn't <laughs> die, and then we lose the presentation, and I become speechless. Chair for this evening's proceedings, good friend, as he just indicated, um, Brother Paget, Henry, um, Mr. Ian Ben, the head of the open campus here of the University of the West Indies in St. John's, Brother George Goodwin, Deputy Chair of the Tim Hector or Leonard Tim Hector Foundation and Memorial Committee and the ACLM, Sister Jennifer. Hector, sisters and brothers, all a very good evening to you. I would firstly like to very sincerely thank the organizers of this very important conference for the signal honor which they have given me by inviting me to deliver this keynote address, not a term that I would have chosen, but their term. At this the opening ceremony of the conference, Tim Hector, Caribbean Politics and Economic Development. I'm sure that there are people more deserving and better able to deliver this address than I am. I could think of one off the top of my head, George Lamming. Um, so I am faced with an extremely daunting responsibility. And I truly hope for Tim's sake that I can do some measure of justice to the task to which I have been assigned. Secondly, I would like to express in my capacity as General Secretary of the Oil Fields Workers Trade Union the congratulations of the Executive Committee, General Counsel, and membership to Paget and Lukey and George and Ian for organizing this activity. The Oil Fees Workers Trade Union and Tim had a relationship of being comrades in the struggle for more than three decades, and he never failed to agree to participate in activities which we organized. We are indeed indebted to him for the contributions that he made to our work, and therefore the least that we could do is to agree to have the union associated with this conference as a co-host. We would really have liked to do much more. In offering our congratulations, I must also make the point that activities such as this are vitally important in this region, which has so little sense of our history and of those who contributed to our development. Our education system, and, and George referred to this, is designed to keep us uneducated about our past, especially that past which is about the struggle to transform our reality from persistent poverty and injustice. Thus, if we were to ask the average West Indian 25-year-old, and I'm glad that there are a number of young people here this evening, if they know anything about Morris Bishop, or Jackie Kreft, or Walter Rodney, we would get a blank stare. But for my generation, these were central figures on the regional landscape. It's almost impossible, as been said before, to conceive that 10 years have elapsed since Tim's sudden and untimely passing. I suppose that this loss of measurement of time is a sign for some of us of advancing years. But it does mean that in another 10 years, what for my generation is a blink of an eye, the average West Indian youth aged 25 then will be blank when asked if they know of Tim Hector. Activities like this one, and I will keep on referring to it in its political sense as an activity and not merely a conference or an event, are thus vital to keep alive the ideas and to inform and educate others of the work and contribution of Tim and others like him, and in the process, stimulate new waves of activism, and it's something we were discussing yesterday morning on our radio program. For this then, we in the ODBTU congratulate the principal organizers. 
I return to this political task of organizing activities, but suffice it to say that I have had the distinct pleasure of collaborating with Paget, as he just mentioned, on similar projects. I refer to the OWTU joining with Paget's University Brown and the University of the West Indies, both the Center for Caribbean Thought at Moda, headed by Professor Brian Meeks, and the Department of History and or the Faculty of Social Sciences at St. Augustine, to organize two important activities. The CLR James at 100, the conference to mark the centennial of his birth, which was held in September of 2001, and the conference on George Padmore, also to commemorate the centennial of his, that is Padmore's birth. And Chair, if you would permit me, I would like to start off this presentation this evening by a somewhat personal reminiscence. It is actually not new, but was my tribute to Tim as written for my column in the Sunday Newsday, the Trinidad newspaper, um, because for some 12 years or so, between 1998, I think, if my memory serves me right, and certainly 2010, I wrote a column in the Sunday Newsday. It was entitled, not as provocatively as Tim's Fanning the Flame, mine was entitled David versus Goliath. <laughs> and this is what I said in my column of November 17, 2002, just days after Tim's passing. I'm just going to quote the entire column as it was written then as, as historical record of what I felt and thought at that time. The Caribbean has lost a giant of a man, and I lost a good friend and comrade, Leonard. And you know, interestingly, the only time I knew his name was Leonard was when I had to send an airline ticket for him to come to something in Trinidad. And I sent the ticket as Tim Hector. <laughs> and when he came to Trinidad, he said, David, it's a good thing that the people in the airport know me as Tim. Otherwise, I couldn't board the, board the plane. <laughs> Sorry, that was, just, that was not in the column, but that was just a, <laughs> a reminiscence. Leonard, and in brackets, Tim, as everyone knew him, was short for Timishenko, the nickname his grandfather gave him. Hector passed away early on Tuesday morning. And when I first got the news, I wished that it was but a rumor. Sadly, that was not the case. I last spoke with Tim on Saturday, September 21st. I called to inform him that another friend and comrade, Lyle Townsend, had suffered a serious heart attack the day before and underwent major surgery which began the night before and ended in the early mo hours of Saturday morning. I first had to apologize to Tim for having taken so long to communicate with him after his own heart surgery some six months earlier and express my concern that I had also heard that he was not well. He casually dismissed my concerns and related the problems that the medication he was taking was giving him. In fact, he said he was traveling to Cuba that very weekend to have this problem checked out, and he felt confident that it was a relatively minor difficulty which would easily be sorted out. Tim quickly moved past my apologies and concerns and asked about the elections, general elections in Trinidad and Tobago being due in a matter of weeks. He reminded me that I was, quote, spot on, close quote, in my analysis of the December 10th, 2001 elections, and so wanted my predictions about October 7th, 20, 2002. In December, and just on a side, Trinidad had a succession of general elections, 2000, 2001, 2002. Can't explain all the ramifications, but those of you who follow Trinidad and Tobago politics would know why we had general elections in 2001 and again in 2002. In December 2001, we were together in Havana, aside Jennifer was there, Luki was there, attending the Sao Paulo Forum, that's a grouping of left and radical political parties from Latin America and the Caribbean. There was quite an English-speaking Caribbean delegation there, Bobby Clark and David Denny of Barbados, Terry Marichaud of Grenada, Ian Monroe of Dominica, Dr. Barry Prasad of Guyana, Renwick Rose of St. Vincent, Antoinette Horton, a friend from my days as a child in rural Jamaica, and of course, Tim and Jennifer, his wife. We discussed many things, informally while listening to some great jazz music at a club whose manager had a close relative, a brother I think it was, who lived in St. Kitts and whom Tim knew well. 
or in a formal meeting where we discussed the need to bring progressive people in the Caribbean together. This was his pet project, the building of a network of progressive Caribbean people. He had proposed a name for it at, an earlier, at earlier meetings. It was One Caribbean in memory of his friend, Maurice Bishop. We also discussed the politics in Trinidad and Tobago. I was telling all that the elections would be exceptionally close with the odds on 1818 a tie. Tim found this hard to believe. And so when we spoke on September 21st, he, this was 2002, he laughed and said, you had it right, you were spot on. It was not a matter of who read the elections correctly or who did not. It was simply two comrades finishing a discussion begun nine months before in another place. So I told him that October 7th would also be close, but that I expected the PNM to win, 1917 perhaps, or perhaps 2016. But the margins would be so small in terms of votes that it was very difficult to predict accurately. We inevitably talked of the One Caribbean project and the fact that some of the things that we had agreed upon in Havana, including my circulating a letter of invitation to people in the region, another mea culpa, did not happen. It was not a very long conversation. It lasted all of perhaps 10 minutes. But we also inquired of our respective families and promised that we would continue it when he returned from Cuba. We last saw each other in Cuba in December 2001 and last spoke when he was on his way back there. Perhaps that was appropriate because he had an enormous amount of respect for what Cuba had achieved and for what Cuba has done in terms of solidarity with those in struggle elsewhere, especially their offers of medical personnel and scholarships to other countries, and of course, the military support for the people of Southern Africa in the battle against apartheid and colonialism. Our friendship spanned just 20 years, but it was a valued and sustained collaboration over those 20 years. I don't recall our very first meeting, but I do vividly remember November 20 to 22, 1982, almost eight, 20 years to this day, in Grenada, at the first conference of Caribbean intellectual workers. We were both part of the group that George Laming had assembled, Intellectuals for the Sovereignty of the Caribbean. Tim Hector possessed one of the best minds that I know. He saw things with great clarity. He was not just a journalist, but a brilliant writer who understood the power of the pen and the need to educate people on all matters, not just the political, so that they could organize themselves politically. He spoke eloquently and passionately about the region and its people. Indeed, he was undoubtedly one of the finest orators in the Caribbean. His talk on CLR James, radical politics and the contemporary world at the CLR James Centennial Conference held here in Trinidad in September 2001 was an absolute masterpiece of clarity, analysis and vision. Tim was also a fantastic conversationalist. A group could sit for hours with Tim talking about everything, though inevitably the subject turned to cricket and to West Indies cricket. He would often regale me with anecdotes about this cricketer or that. I'm not saying anything because I'm an, in Antigua. <laughs> Tim loved to talk, but he was not a talker. He walked the talk. He was an intellectual and a writer, but not an armchair theoretician. After all, he went to jail on more than one occasion for his convictions. He opposed his country's government for its corruption and exposed it. But he attacked with even greater strength all the petty Caribbean politicians who focused on their little kingdoms and who presided over failure after failure. Tim was an avid reader and absolutely loved to read the Trinidad and Tobago newspapers. In fact, he had a love affair with the Trinidad media. He told me that as a young boy in the 1950s, he used to listen on the radio to the Legislative Council debates and be in awe of Williams, Lionel Sukaran, and Winston Mahabir. He also used to get copies of the Trinidad and Tobago newspapers. Antigua, after all, had no dailies until recently, and could probably tell you more about what was being written in the Trinidad press than the average Trini. And so whenever I went to Antigua, I would be sure to buy every single newspaper for him. 
Indeed, at a special tribute to Tame organized some years ago by his friends and close associates, and at which I had the very special honor to be an invited speaker, I ended my tribute with the only gift I thought he would appreciate, a package of that day's Trinidad and Tobago newspapers. Tim was a man of great courage. He made huge sacrifices. He could easily have been an outstanding academic, comfortably a scone in some Ivory League university. Instead, he chose to tough it out in a small island where, once you have strong beliefs, you are not only bound to make enemies, but be sure to, or be, but sure to be unable to hide from them. So he was persecuted and harassed, jailed, and oftentimes misunderstood. Sure, he had his weaknesses, and I have no doubt that he made errors, political and personal. But then, is there any without sin who dares to cast the first stone? Perhaps in death, Antiguans will better appreciate what they had in Tim Hector. Throughout his trials and tribulations, he stood stoic and firm. I vividly recall several crucial events. His first wife, Era, was brutally murdered in May 1989 by a person whom Tim had tried to help by giving him a job. It must have been an extremely traumatic, it must have been extremely traumatic for Tim. Yet within hours of burying Era, he came to Trinidad for the funeral of his mentor, CLR James. It was a horrific double blow. Yet Tim was able not only to be here for Nello's funeral, but to read at the funeral a tribute to him done by Viv Richards. I recall to my wife and I because Tim stayed with us taking him shortly after that to a play at the Central Bank Auditorium. I don't remember its name, but I had not done the research about the theme. It was a very heavy play that dealt with, of all things, death. I was terribly concerned because Tim was visi visibly disturbed. I was sitting next to him and he was shifting every five seconds in his chair. He was visibly disturbed by the images it must have generated. I quietly asked if he had wanted to leave and he said no. Afterwards, when I apologized for an inappropriate choice, he responded by saying that perhaps that was what he needed to confront the death of Era. He was almost grateful. And then there was the arson at the outlet a few years ago. I was in Antigua shortly after that incident and we spoke of the trials through which the, he was going through. He was as philosophical as ever, but the tone in his voice betrayed the brave face. I know that he was deeply wounded by the burning of the outlet, as he was by the assassination of Morris and comrades in Grenada and the destruction of that revolution and the sudden death of his old friend Rosie Douglas last year. Yet he summoned all his energies and the paper was not silenced. In a very real sense, just as the outlet could not be silenced, still Tim's voice will never ever be silenced, for his is a voice of conscience. I believe that the last few years of his life were good for him, in spite of all the pain and the grief, mainly because of his family, his sons and stepdaughters, and of course, Jennifer. He seemed very boyish with, when Jennifer was around. I remember there being in Trinidad for Kai Festa. Jennifer, you might remember that. I think I'd organized for you all to stay somewhere up in Marval um, at a hotel there. And he was obviously very happy. His sons made him proud though he would confess that they surprised him by what they were achieving. And Jennifer's daughters were very much his own. To his family, I offer my solidarity. We all feel a very deep sense of loss, for he had so much still to contribute. There is only one thing for us to do, and that is to bring about the one Caribbean that he so correctly believed would be the one of the keys to humanizing this space that we all call home. Tim Hector, it was a privilege and honor to have known you and to have shared your friendship. That's what I wrote in November 2002, and perhaps was my best column. <laughs> Not because of me, but because of Tim. To illustrate just how valued and sustained our collaboration was, and this was not simply a personal collaboration, but organizational, though the two are never completely indistinguishable, there was hardly a year that we did not engage in a joint effort in the enterprise of building consciousness and thus creating a movement to transform the Caribbean. I'd actually forgotten some of the details and so did a partial check, which I wouldn't read because time is, is running. Suffice it to say that there was hardly a year between the, the early 1980s and the time of his passing 
that we did not meet in some activity, some conference, some event, or that we did not invite him to come and speak at the OW2, at a training program, or some other activity of the union, or at meetings of the Standing Committee of Opposition Parties of the Eastern Caribbean, SCOPE. Don't know how many of us remember SCOPE. Or at meetings at the home of Bobby Clark in Barbados in the mid to late 1990s, where there were other people like Rosie Douglas and Ralph Gonzalez and others who would have attended when we talked about this project of One Caribbean. Or at meetings in London for the International Book Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books, or at meetings of the Sao Paulo Forum or the Solidarity Events in Havana. Or when I came to Antigua, perhaps, on trade union activities in solidarity with the Antigua Workers' Union. Thus, I am sure that Tim's understanding of Trinidad and Tobago and of the labor movement and of radical politics would have contributed to the founders of the Antigua Workers' Union, as it was first named, seeking the support of George Weeks and the rebel leadership of the OW2 as they started along the daunting journey of establishing and building a trade union that would challenge and rival the old Antigua and Barbuda trades and labor union. Indeed, as the historians will no doubt chronicle, the AWU and its leadership, um, Brother Daniel, Keaton Smith, one Baldwin Spencer as well, learned a lot about unionism at the Paramount Building, the headquarters of the Oilfields Workers Trade Union. In 1977-78, when Tim informed the OW2 of what was happening with space research in Antigua, you remember SRC? And the attack by the Byrd government on dock workers, ACR members, and all others who opposed SRC's operations in Antigua, and the shipping of arms via Antigua to the apartheid regimes in Southern Africa, George Weeks, the then President General of the OW2, responded immediately. We, through our members on the waterfront at Texaco, then multinational company operating the Point Pierre refinery, imposed an oil embargo on Antigua. This was an extension of the embargo of any oil products that the OW2 effected against South Africa. We had a ban on any ship, any products that we suspected were going to South Africa. In conformity with the international campaign by oil and dock workers in solidarity with the movements in Southern Africa. As a result of that embargo which we imposed on Antigua, some 17 oil workers, members of our union, were suspended by Texaco for their actions. But it was not in vain because eventually SRC had to leave not just Antigua, but Barbados as well. In 1984, the OW2 sent a cable to Prime Minister Byrd in solidarity with him when he was jailed for publishing statements, quote, likely to undermine confidence in the conduct of public affairs, close quote. But we went further. As Tim himself said in 1990, on the occasion of giving the feature address at the installation of executive officers of the OWTU, and I'm quoting from his address, this is the first time I have met Senator Alan Alexander since he freed me from prison. Comrade Alexander came to Antigua with the assistance of the OWTU and defended me in a constitutional motion in the High Court and was successful. Alan was one of our leading senior counsels, still alive but not so well. Tim goes on. The case went to the appeal court, the government appealing, and the appeal court re-established the sentence. It finally ended up at the Privy Council. But it is worthy of note that the Privy Council, in giving judgment in my favor, referred in its judgment to statements made by Alan Alexander as establishing the fundamental principles by which the press ought to be regulated in these parts of the world. I certainly wish to thank him and to thank the OWTU for the tremendous assistance given in the struggle, not only for press freedom in Antigua, because three other governments had planned similar legislation, and were it not for the OWTU and Allen, these countries would have, had, would have been similarly affected, afflicted rather, as Antigua was. A blow was struck for freedom, end of quote. This was Tim. He focused not primarily on his getting out of jail, but on the need to strike a blow for press freedom, and not just in Antigua and Barbuda, but throughout the Caribbean. And so that relationship, as I've just described, between Tim and the OWTU goes back and is very, very, was very, very strongly rooted in solidarity and struggle. 
Tim simply was one of our best sons. But don't take it on my say so. One of the most celebrated Caribbean writers and progressive thinkers, George Lamming, in a talk given at UWI Mona in 2003 at a conference celebrating his work said this, and I'm quoting George, the second loss that I've experienced was the passing of Tim Hector, who combined a magnificent and philosophical intelligence with the investigative skills of a journalist, close quote. And a long-standing comrade and friend of Tim's, Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez, in one of the tributes at Tim's funeral, and I was there and I heard it with my own ears, said this, quote, Tim Hector was the best Prime Minister that Antigua never had. <laughs> and Ralph said that in the presence of his CARICOM Prime Ministerial colleague, then Prime Minister Lester Byrd, who was also on the stage. Those of you who were there at the funeral would remember that. Why then was Tim Hector so special and so important? Firstly, because he was an intellectual giant, and other speakers before me have referred to that. A man who possessed a magnificent and philosophical intelligence. As all of us who knew him were well aware, Tim read voraciously. It was in his own words, quote, in our house, money was always the scarcest commodity. Manufactured toys were few. For presents, I got books. From early, a love of reading became a natural part of my life, close quote. The breadth of Tim's knowledge often had many of us in awe. This was most evident in his lecture on CLR James, radical politics, and the contemporary world, delivered at the James at 100 conference. And just as an anecdote, I was listening to that CD again in preparation for this. And at the start of it, he said that while he was perhaps a very good student of James, he had not as yet mastered the breadth of James's knowledge, nor did he have James's discipline. And so he said that James used to say, and I, used to, I heard James myself say it on many an occasion, that it is now 7.30 and I'll be making four points and I'll be stopping in exactly 30 minutes. And at 8 o'clock, James would fold up his notes and sit down and <laughs> say any questions. So, so Tim was, 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 was confessing that he didn't have that mastery and therefore would not speak for a short time, which he didn't. <laughs> he spoke for well over an hour. I must confess that I don't have Tim's mastery of knowledge and the breadth of his knowledge, nor do I have um, James's discipline either. So if I run over time, chair, knock a little bit and tell me, David, hold up. But to address that issue of the contemporary world, which Tim did in September 2001. Remember, this was just days after 9-11. Hector started, started us off in antiquity with references to the Roman and Greek civilizations and quotations from notable persons from those eras that were relevant to George W. Bush. It was quite amazing. Of course, he examined the civilizations. I recall, for example, he saying, well, you know, I've dealt with Rome, I've dealt with Greece, I now have to take a jet plane, which some of you might be reluctant to do. This was days after 9-11, right? It was his wit um, and, and brilliance of, of shifting from one era to the other um, with, with, such political, with such political meaning. It was quite amazing. And of course, he examined the civilizations of Africa and Europe as well as the formation of the Caribbean. It was a tour de force, and Paget needs to be published. Many of those who possess a great mind are, however, not good at expressing their views. Tim was not one of those. He had a tremendous clarity of thought. In his lectures and in panel presentations, he took one through the steps of discovery, so at the end, all one could say was true. The sheer logic of his ideas and the facts and information mustered and presented cogently and compelling were borne out not only out of his breadth of knowledge, but the clarity of his thinking. His knowledge, his clarity of thinking, and his ability to communicate orally and in writing mark the outstanding intellectual that was Tim Hector. 
The general experience of the ordinary men and women in the Caribbean with our intellectuals is not a good one. For one thing, our intellectuals do not think that ordinary people who do not possess tertiary or even secondary education can understand intellectual fear. Of course, this is nonsense, and I'll come back to that, to why in a moment. And so, our intellectuals also don't think it necessary to, or just cannot write and speak in a style that the ordinary citizen can grasp. They use language that seeks to almost deliberately, and I'll use one of those words now, obfuscate the reality, <laughs> or deny their fellow citizens the knowledge that they have obtained. Throughout the region, the stories are legion about this gap between the intellectual who uses big words and the working man and woman. Tim was able to bridge that gap. When he wrote about literature, he related it to the life experiences of working people in Antigua. When he gave a historical narrative, he connected the dots with the audience's reality. In the talk that he gave at the OWTU as a panelist at the forum, together with Bjordan Jefo of Nigeria and Dakos Hau of Trinidad and London, the forum Africa, Europe, and the Caribbean, which we did organize in 1984, he took us through the historical experience from slavery to post-independence. As he described one phase of the anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggle, this is what Tim said, and I'm quoting him. And you have to understand one of the great contributors of the anti-imperialist struggle. A fellow wrote a calypso in Trinidad, and he said, look, you see this American capital? It leads to the degradation of Jean and Dinah. While he brings his wealth and money, it degrades Jean and Dinah. And when the Yankees gone, degradation will continue. Even Sparrow says he will take over now. I'll throw it to the mic. And wants all the degradation to continue. Let me just go back to that because we lost the mic. While he brings his wealth and money, degrades Jean and Dinah. And when the Yankees gone, degradation will continue. Even Sparrow says he will take over now and wants all the degradation to continue. And a lot of people didn't understand what Sparrow said. I don't think I understood it until I came back when I was at the Lever Brothers Strike Camp, group of workers organized by the ODBQ, who on strike in 1984. I, understand, I understood it. So not because they go, you will necessarily make a leap. Putting them out is good, but you could put them out, but still continue with the same degradation that they used to go on with. You don't have to pay so much because you don't have so much. Remember Sparrow's phrase? You get it all for nothing? That was Tim. Everyone in the audience could understand what the post-colonial reality was from that single paragraph. And Tim's use, not of a long so-called intellectual discourse, but of reference to Sparrow's Jean and Dinah. This was because Tim was a radical and revolutionary political activist who understood what for him being an intellectual meant. It is a theme that Laming returns to time and time again. With reference to Walter Rodney, Laming wrote, quote, Rodney wanted to participate in overthrowing the hegemonies of the plantation and its Western institutions to work towards the emergence of an alternative consciousness. He did not share the view of many of his colleagues that scholarship should seek to achieve a posture of neutrality. He believed that history was a way of ordering knowledge which could become an active part of the consciousness of an untutored mass of ordinary people. He did not only argue with those who had taken permanent refuge in the enclave of research and doctoral pursuit. He walked and talked with those African and Indian peasants and workers who had become the raison d'etre of his, his intellectual activities. He had initiated in his personal and professional life a decisive break with the tradition he had been trained to serve." End of quote. As for Rodney, so too for Hector. This ought not to surprise us, since they both had a common mentor, C.L.R. James. Hector was a member of the James Study Group in Canada that included Rosie Douglas, Robert Hill, Booker Rennie, and Franklin Harvey, while Rodney was in, Lon in the London Study Group 
along with such notables as Norman Gervon, Richard Small, and Orlando Patterson. In Laming's tribute to CLR James, delivered at James's funeral, the celebration of a life, he said this about James, quote, to think was to engage in an act of pure and complete participation, close quote. Tim, writing of Stokely Carmichael, Tim said he always called him Stokely and not Kwame Ture, said, quote, Praxis, I'm quoting Tim now, Praxis, the great modern philosopher, Antonio Gram Gramsci, elevated into a philosophical concept. It means the unity of theory and practice. Of Praxis, Stokely was a living embodiment, close quote. Tim then described how as a student, Stokely got deeply involved in the struggle against racism and for civil and human rights in the US as the manifestation of the practice of social change. In similar vein, Tim returned after his university education to Antigua and immediately became involved in political activism, writing and organizing. I will not presume, dare to presume in fact, to talk of these activities to an audience that was intimately involved in one way or another, on one side or perhaps on another in those activities. Suffice it to say that Hector, whatever his faults, was himself the embodiment of praxis here in Antigua. And as we, as, as, as we shall come to throughout the Caribbean. As I, write, as I wrote in my tribute, Tim could have easily taken the easy road. He could have done postgraduate studies for which his intellect more than qualified him to excel in. Thus equipped, he could have had a stellar academic career at any top-rate university, lived a life of relative material comfort, raised his family, and from time to time contribute to his native land. Or he could have returned to Antigua or somewhere else in the Caribbean and taught at secondary or even tertiary level, not earning as much as if he had become a university professor in North America or Europe, but still doing decently enough, together with having the respect and some privilege that such persons enjoy in our small societies. Instead, Hector engaged in the practice of what he believed in, the need for the transformation of Caribbean society. And to this end, he fanned the flame. The newspaper was the obvious means for so doing. In this, he was in the tradition of Lenin and James. Both these revolutionaries were firm believers in a newspaper as an organizer of political action and of the related task of raising consciousness. James, of course, had famously edited the nation, the newspaper of the PNM, the People's National Movement, of Williams in Trinidad. But he had written for many other papers and journals, including the Beacon in Trinidad in the early 30s, and for a number of radical and revolutionary organizations in England and the US. Of all of James's students, when it came to the praxis of communicating ideas to build a movement through a newspaper, Tim was by far and away the most outstanding. Similarly, Tim understood what a progressive newspaper had to be. It had to reflect, inform, analyze, and thus educate its readers in every sphere of their existence. The outlet did precisely that. It was not the ideological mouthpiece of the ACM in the way that left parties throughout the region produced their organs, as we did in Sri Lanka today or many years ago with left organizations. Yet, in fact, it was a good reflection of the ideology of the ACM, which was to identify with and improve the lives of ordinary Antigons and Barbudians. Very importantly, Tim also knew that these ordinary men and women could understand ideas that our traditional intellectuals thought them incapable of comprehending. Indeed, Tim knew that the ordinary people themselves not only comprehended, but themselves had and expressed complex ideas as a result of their own experience, the theory and practice that must exist out of their daily activity of production. Laming wrote, and I'm quoting Laming, the word intellectual may be applied to all forms of labor, which could not possibly be done without some exercise of the mind. In this sense, the fishermen and the farmer may be regarded as cultural and intellectual workers in their own right. Social practice has provided them with a considerable body of knowledge and a capacity to make discriminating judgments in, the da in their daily work. If we do not regard them as cultural and intellectual workers, it is largely, I think, because of the social stratification 
which is created by the division of labor and the legacy of an education system which was designed to reinforce such a division in our modes of perceiving social reality, close quote. Hector himself wrote of the stimulation and education which he received from ordinary people. And I'm quoting him, and I know you know this, Ivan Jones Edwards and George Nugget Joseph, who fathered Hell's Gate and the Steel Band. Their discussions on steel bands, music, Islam, and such other topics were simply remarkable. And then, as George talked about the worldview and the education system, I wouldn't, I wouldn't continue with that particular quote. The outlet, therefore, set out to and did provide an alternative education for its readers and to give people a worldview. C.L.R. James had once famously said that, quote, what is philosophy today becomes reality tomorrow. Close quote. Ideas stimulate action. Timothy understood this as he had written about the seminar Black Writers Conference in Montreal, which he was involved in organizing, and of similar activities, there is often resulting political action that is transformative. Certainly the fifth Pan-African Conference held in Manchester, England in 1945, and organized directly by George Padmore, with support from afar by CLR, was one such event. It was attended by notables such as Kwame Nkrumah and Jomo Kenyatta, as well as West Indian labor leaders, including the then President General of my own union, the ODQ. That Pan-African Congress set out the agenda for the decolonization struggle in much the same way as the early conferences of West Indian labor leaders had done in the 20s and 30s. The Montreal Conference of Black Writers was a similar activity. And this is why I said earlier in my presentation this evening that this activity is of such great importance and why the organizers should be commended. It is why Tim never said no to an invitation to speak and participate in conferences, seminars, education, sessions organized by the ODBQ and other progressive organizations here and elsewhere in the world. But this was, especially in the case of my union, also due to Tim's belief that only the working people can bring about the fundamental transformation that is required. In this, he was an adherent to the position articulated by James that quote, every cook can govern. His addresses at the ODBQ always centered on the role of the workers' movement and of working people in the process of transformation. In writing of Stokely and of the struggle against racism and for black power, which Stokely had defined as, quote, control of the institutions and of the communities where we live and a stop to the exploitation of the non-white people around the world, close quote, Tim said this, to achieve that end, that is black power, the social forces in the civil rights movement had to change with students allied to working people. After all, black power can only be the work of people disciplined by capitalist production and the cooperative association it breeds on the work floor and in society." Close quote. For Tim, it was always about the transformative power of working people, especially within the context of the history of the Caribbean. And if the chair allows me, I'll just briefly quote one of the things he said in that talk on Africa, Europe, and the Caribbean about the role of working people. He said, quote, let us be clear about that. So the struggles of the working people creates that, brings that to the Caribbean. The British say that it looks like this thing is going to explode, and the money that we're making out of the Caribbean could end. So let us satisfy them, and so on, and give them the vote. It is the struggle of the people that won these concessions, the right to combine in unions, the right to vote, the right to universal education, the right to publish newspapers, etc. I hear people calling them bourgeois rights. They are wrong. The rights were won, secured, and gained by the struggles and sacrifices by the working people." End of quote. In this regard, he would, have, he would have agreed completely with Arthur Lewis, who in 1939 in his celebrated pamphlet, Labor in the West, West Indies, wrote, and I'm quoting Lewis, the labor movement is on the march. Imagine, most people don't know that Lewis actually had great respect for the labor movement, given his later um, debates about Caribbean political economy. But this is what Lewis wrote. The labor movement is on the march. It has already behind it a history of achievement in a short space of time. It, the labor movement, will make of the West Indies of the future 
a country where the common man may lead a cultural life in freedom and prosperity, close quote. Tim reported that Walter and he, on Walter's insistence, should produce a critique of Lewis. But Tim grudgingly perhaps recognized some of Lewis's insights when the latter raised the question as to how could such distinguished nationalists as Manley, that is Norman, Adams, that is Grantley, not the son, and Williams allow the Federation to fail. Lamming suggests that the reason lay in the fact that they were, quote, casualties of an inherited tutelage, which was colonial in essence, and thereby placed an overwhelming constraint on the context, concept of liberation. To be more direct, the only way the Federation could have succeeded is if the movement for Red Federation was led, as it was at the start, by the labor movement. It was in Tim's own words, I'm now referring to him, saying about the Federation. The leaders and some of the members of the new trade unions met and they said we wanted a federation. So you hear who started it, not the middle class intellectuals and professionals. They will take it over eventually when it became popular. They will take charge then. And Tim went on to say, the nationalist parties that came to power, the Manleys and the Adams and the Williamses, after getting adult suffrage, after obtaining a fully elected legislature, after getting so many ministers, jettisoned the program of the mass nationalist movement. Again, the old economic relations of foreign power and worker subordination remain. The nationalist movement has left the unholy mess which, he, which we have inherited as their legacy to this day. James was more brutal in his assessment of the West Indian middle classes, and because it's getting late, I will leave out what James said of the West Indian middle classes. He said that they have no ideas of their own. And he wrote that in Party Politics in the West Indies. I will include it in the text, and you will get the full text. Um, but James was absolutely brutal about the West Indian middle classes. Tim was very clear as well about why we needed fundamental transformation. It was not transformation for transformation's sake. And so it, in one of his essays on Walter Rodney, Tim said this, and I think it's best that Tim speaks, we, we hear his voice about, about the crisis that we are in and the need to transform the Caribbean. And Tim said, the whole idea of parliamentary democracy is based on a party representing the wealth-owning class, the Tories, the Republicans, the Christian Democrats in Germany or Italy, and on the other hand, a party representing labor such as the Labour Party of Britain, or the Social Democrats in Europe, or the Democrats in the USA. The compromises between these two parties constituted politics, the means by which the national bourgeoisie, the industrial class, controlled their own nations. He then went on to say, these conditions were non-existent in the English-speaking Caribbean, in that there was no native wealth-owning class in control of the economy to be represented by a party. There could only be a party of labour, so in Barbados, we had two labor parties, each dividing the working people. In Antigua and Barbuda, there's the Bird Party and the Walter Spencer Labor Party, each based on rival sections of the labor movement. In Jamaica, there is the Manly Labor Party and the Bustamante Labor Party, where the rivalry between both sections of the working people involves so much violence that the violence has become independent of both parties and an end in itself. Jamaica's proof negative where such politics inevitably ends, to which end all other parties in the region, similarly based, are tending in well, inevitably. In Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana, where the races constitute the working people, the parties have based themselves each on one oppressed race. Racialism is the order of the day. And he then goes on to say, Therefore, no significant wealth-owning class made up of Africans and Indians has emerged. Therefore, the self-interest of creating wealth does not serve as a glue to unite the races. The politics of racism, racialism, exploiting the suspicion of one race against the other, predominates. Foreign capital rules, accumulates, and exports capital. Or an elite mismanages nationalized industries, bringing them to rack and ruin. And he goes on. That is what he described as our reality. And that is what reality he said we needed tra to transform. 
He went on to say, indeed what passes for politics in the Caribbean is not development, but the distribution of state patronage. Those who are in, get. Those who are out, get not. This has led to wasteful pub public projects. And Trinidad and Tobago, that is ever so much in abundance. I can't do it, I don't know what is Antigua. And public enterprises and statutory bodies as instruments of state patronage. In the end, the state becomes bankrupt. It then has to endure IMF or homegrown structural adjustment. The independence hopes, aspirations, and dreams were thus structurally adjusted into sheer opposite. That is, cynicism, don't give a damnism, and downright nightmare. Mysticism, fundamentalism, and lotteryism seizes hold of a population who sees no exit. That, in plain terms, is our current condition everywhere in the English-speaking Caribbean. And it is that understanding of the reality of the Caribbean that drove Tim's thinking and activism to the need for transformation. That is why he fanned the flames, not just fanning the flames for his own self-aggrandizement, for people to say that Tim was a bright man and knew everything through his columns and so on, but fanning the flames to result in the transformation of our Caribbean. And so this is where I'm going to end with a sense of our Caribbean. Before Paget knocks me down. And I, I'm going to just quote two parts of what Tim said at the Old With You. One when he spoke in 1990. And he said, what I want to suggest is that there can come into existence a different kind and approach to Caribbean unity. Not one of these island economies are any longer viable in a world of con continental economies. They become an anachronism and an absurdity. The first notion of dominion status in the Caribbean was first raised politically in Trinidad by Uriah Butler, not for Trinidad, but for the Caribbean. By then, not even CLR James had written the cause for West Indian self-government. At least he hadn't conceived it as complete independence. He then went on to say, the only two can claim paternity of the idea of Caribbean unity, and it is in my view that the only two ought to produce its child. I believe it is the responsibility of the workers of ODBQ to charge its officers to go through the region, uniting the progressive political and trade union forces, bringing together as much as possible women, farmers, youth, to unite the Caribbean from the bottom up to the top down. And he went on to say, we cannot create a united Caribbean without a popular democracy in each Caribbean territory. We are well placed to create a new kind of state in a united Caribbean, organized and directed by the working people of the Caribbean, and OWTU can initiate it. And then in 1984, just to show the continuity of his ideas, I started with 90 and I'm going back to 84. He said, in the coming Caribbean revolution, which will create our Caribbean nation out of the 27 island or coastal nations of the Caribbean, that that tendency, he was talking to about the core tendency, cannot win. The Caribbean island or coastal nation states cannot find any other way out of the present crisis until each island or coastal nation overcomes foreign domination of the economy and in the process of that overcoming creates a regional Caribbean nation meeting the needs of Caribbean industry and agriculture. Only such a Caribbean nation can withstand and overcome the buffetings of imperialism. Only such a Caribbean nation can realize the hopes and re release the creative spirit and genius of the Caribbean people, end quote. So he found the flames, he found the flames for transformation, not simply of Antigua and Barbuda, but of the Caribbean, recognizing that only one Caribbean could achieve with the leadership of the working people from below, could achieve the aspirations that we have had from slavery to now. And so in the meetings that we had, those last meetings that we had at Bobby Clark's home and in Cuba, we talked of this one Caribbean project. And we were supposed to get and have people do studies. I'm sure you must have talked about it with comrades here. Studies on how do we transform and ensure Caribbean economies could feed ourselves and we could have food security, then known food sovereignty now. How can we deal with regional transport and trade? 
how do we address the problems of unemployment and the issues of the mobilization of capital for our own development. And we were supposed to set up groups to study all of these things because the question for us then all in opposition was what happens if we were to win government? Would we be able to come equipped with the tools and the knowledge and the studies to be able to transform our Caribbean economies and governance and so on. It reminded me of the famous story of then Prime Minister a and R. Robinson visiting CLR James in Brixton in London and James lying down in his bed upstairs raised today and Robinson thinking that perhaps James was a little off the rocker said to James, Mr. James, do you remember me? And James said with his usual wit and very direct political purpose, of course I do. You're the young man who always wanted to be prime minister. Now that you have gotten it, what are you going to do with it? And so in that kind of understanding, we were supposed in this one Caribbean project to engage in this discussion. Rosie was there. We never completed that project, became prime minister, and then didn't know what to do and was running his and scissor, trying to get money just to pay public servants. And all of that flying all over the place, trying to keep the Dominican economy afloat when bananas had crashed, probably led to his death. Ralph came to one session and then didn't come back. And then Ralph became prime minister. Same story. So Tim's vision of us needing to do the work before is vitally important. And that was because for him, he was a Marxist in the tradition of James, Rodney, Amilcar Cabral, and others, who saw that Marxism was not a dogma, but as a methodology of thought and analysis and as a guide to action. Tim Hector, Tim Hector, until he drew his last breath, fan the flames for the transformation of the Caribbean. Thank you very much.